Good to be with you all this morning. It's always a blessing when we can be together. I'd like to begin our lesson with a quote that I came across that I thought was very fitting for the content that we want to study together today. A quote by a certain man by the name of Thomas Kempis. He said, above all, we must be especially alert against the beginnings of temptation, for the enemy is more easily conquered if he is refused admittance to the mind and is met beyond the threshold when he knocks. The title of our lesson is, Who at My Door is Standing? Now we sing a song by that title from time to time based on a quotation from the book of Revelation in chapter 3. And the idea behind that song is that Jesus, of course, is at the door and he is knocking and he desires to come in so that we might be blessed, so that we might have eternal life. And while we are going to be talking about the concept of Jesus at the door in this lesson, I want us to also think about who else is at the door. Because it's not only Christ who is knocking and desiring to come in and dwell with us, but there is another as well who knocks daily. And for many, he is more often the dinner guest than who should be that being the Son of God. The reality is that there are two parties that seek entrance into your heart. Now the first, as we said, is of course Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We had alluded to Revelation 3 and verse 20, which reads, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. But also, we think about what is said in Genesis chapter 4. You recall the story of Cain and Abel, and how they both brought offerings to God, sacrifices, and Abel's sacrifice was acceptable to God. And we come to find later on through Revelation in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, but that was because it was offered by faith, as it says there. And so Cain also offered a sacrifice to God, but it was not according to the word of God. It was not according to the instructions, evidently, that they'd been given as to what was acceptable. And so Cain was upset about that. He became jealous of his brother. And in verse 6 of Genesis chapter 4 there, the Lord speaks to Cain. And this is before, of course, he goes on to murder his brother. And so God is seeking to intercept what he sees coming, he tries to reason with him and warn him. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do well, notice what he says sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. So you have this picture of these two different parties. Now, if you're like me, when you get that unexpected knock at the door, <laughs> it's not usually something that's welcomed, right? We're, we're thinking, well, who is bothering me? <laughs> and sometimes we don't even answer the door, right? Because we just don't want to interact with whoever it is. We're not expecting anybody, right? But you imagine, you know, you're sitting there in your home and you hear this knock at the door and you peek through the blinds there and see, well, who is it? Now, if you saw Satan, this, you know, guy that looks like some kind of, you know, monster with horns and, you know, flames shooting out of him, obviously you're, you're not going to answer the door, right? You're probably going to go hide in the bedroom and make sure all the doors are locked. But the thing is about Satan is he doesn't come to us in the form of something that is scary, something that 
is frightening, something that looks threatening. Uh, but he comes to us in the form of something that looks appealing. And so we have to educate ourselves, don't we? And that is really the, the point of this lesson, is we want to educate ourselves, to enlighten ourselves about the reality of the choice that we face every day as to who we are going to let come in and dwell with us, who we are going to have a relationship with in a spiritual way. And think about which of those two relationships is the one that we really we really desire, the one that's really going to lead us to an eternity that will be one of joy versus one of torment. As we think about Jesus and his knocking at the door, Jesus will always come to the front door. You might be thinking, well, what does that mean? <laughs> well, it simply means that Jesus is not going to try and force himself into your life. He's not going to try and deceive you into believing in him or trick you in some way. He's not going to come around the back door when you're not expecting him to and, aha, surprise, I'm here. He's just simply going to put forth an offer at the front door and hope that you will listen to his offer and be willing to accept it to let him come in because his desire is simply to bless us, to save us from certain destruction. I'd like to read a, a portion of John chapter 10. We're going to look at a couple of different sections of the chapter here together. Jesus is speaking here, and he says there in verse 1, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him. For they do not know the voice of strangers. I heard a story once. Somebody had traveled over to uh, the Middle East for a time to see the, the region and see some of the places from the biblical record, things of that nature. And during the course of their travels, they relayed this episode where they had come to this watering hole where all the shepherds would bring their flocks in to be watered. And so they spent a little bit of time there kind of observing how that played out and how that worked. And he shared this uh, incident where, of course, you've got all these different sheep from different shepherds coming to the same location to be watered. But he said he observed this one shepherd get up after his sheep had drank enough and he called them, began to walk away, back to the pasture. And you might think, well, what happened? Which sheep fought? You know, there's all these different herds there. But he said it was so amazing because only the sheep that he had brought there are the ones that then got up and followed him away from the water. Because they knew his voice. They knew who, the, who their shepherd was. I thought that was a really interesting story in it. It plays into what Jesus is relaying here. Jumping down to verse 11 of the text there, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and he leaves, and the, sheep, uh, leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. But I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Of course, verse 18, of that same context there, he says, No one takes it from me, referring to his life. 
but he says, I lay it down of myself. And so we see Jesus came to us, died for us, and is knocking at the door, desiring that we would accept this free gift that he is offering through the blood that he shed, that we could be cleansed, that we could ourselves die and bury the old man of sin and be resurrected as he was to eternal life. But he comes in, as it says there, through the door. He doesn't climb up some other way. He doesn't try and sneak around the back. That's what thieves and robbers do. But again, it's up to us to let him in. It's up to us to make the decision. You think back to Joshua chapter 24, there at verse 14, where Joshua is speaking to the nation of Israel. He says, Therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or Perhaps the God of, of the Amorites in, who, in whose land you're dwelling. But he says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Familiar passage to us. But you see here, and we see this consistently, God offers us the ability to choose. He created us with free will for that very reason, that we would choose. Not that we would be programmed to do a certain thing against our will, but that we would choose to serve him, choose to love him as he's loved us. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 9, we read here about the other party that seeks entrance. And we're going to talk more about him here in just a minute, but kind of segueing into that. Verse 9 there, Paul writes and says, The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power signs and lying wonders with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because notice he says they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved and for this reason it says God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but rather had pleasure in unrighteousness so in other words, what this is explaining here is that if we choose to reject the offer that God has placed on the table before us, choose to reject his son, choose to rather believe the lie of the adversary, God is not going to force it on us. That's what he's saying here. When it talks about God sending them strong delusion, it's just basically the idea that he's going to allow them to be deluded in the things that they want to be deluded by. When he sees his creation rebelling against him and believing these lies, he's not going to force their hand and say, no, you're going to love me. You're going to follow me. He respects our ability to choose. And that's what I mean by Jesus always comes to the front door. Now, having acknowledged all of that, we must acknowledge the strategy of the other part. Satan will seek entrance at every opening that you have at your dwelling. He will come to the back door. He will come to the side door. He'll try and find an open window. Maybe he'll come down the chimney dressed as Santa Claus. I don't know. But he will look for any opportunity to deceive you, to work his way into your life. So that he ultimately can wreck you and destroy you. How many warnings are we given in scripture about how cunning and crafty our adversary is? There's a little kid song. I say it's a little kid song because typically we sing it Sunday school and things of that nature. But really it's not just a kid song if you think about the message of the song. But be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. Be careful, little feet, where you go. 
And we direct that at our children to train them up in the way that they ought to go, to, to think rationally as they grow and have to make decisions for themselves. But that's a warning that applies very much to us as adults as well, doesn't it? We have to be careful what we look at. We have to be careful about what we're listening to. We have to be careful about where we choose to go and spend our time. Because we could very well be leaving the window open, as it were, for Satan to come in and to destroy us. 1 Peter 5 and verse 8 tells us to be sober, to be vigilant, because your adversary, he says, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. You think back to what God spoke to Cain, how sin is crouching there at the door. You just picture this, this lion that's just like lying in wait. You've seen, I'm sure, documentaries before of the African savanna, right? And how the lion will sit there in the, in the tall grass and you can just see the eyes there. He blends in, his camouflage, just waiting for the right moment. Waiting for you to just crack the door a little bit so he can come on in and overtake you. Luke chapter 12, verse 39 says, But know this, Jesus is speaking here, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. That's the thing about our adversary. He doesn't come to us necessarily when we're ready. You know, you're sitting there reading your Bible and you're maybe saying a prayer. That's not the time he's going to try and get you. you no, know, it's the time where you're not paying attention, where you're a little bit off guard. And he'll come at you at an angle that maybe he's never come at you before. You know, you put up all these defenses over here because, well, I know I have this weakness and I have that weakness and I tend to... You know, I, I get carried away with this sometimes, so I'm going to put up all these defenses here because I know these are things I struggle with. Okay, well, let me come at you this way then. And that's how it works. And you're not, you're not ready for that. You weren't expecting that. And so that's why, going back to the previous verse we looked at there, the idea of vigilance is you're just, you're always watching. You're always looking around. You know, there's the, the passage there in Ephesians, it talks about walking circumspectly. It's the idea that you're, you're looking all around. You're not just focused on the front door. You're thinking about, okay, well, I did, did I think about what's back here? Did I check for a hole there or some place that he could weasel in over here? Matthew 7, verse 15, this speaks to what we commented on a little earlier. <laughs> Beware of false prophets, Jesus says, who come to you in sheep's clothing. But inwardly, they are ravenous wolves. And so Satan's not always going to come to us in the form of that ferocious lion that looks scary at all. We certainly don't want to let that into our house. You know, so often it comes in the form of what seems to be innocent, what seems to be harmless, but yet is something dangerous that is veiled. And we can think about all kinds of, you know, think about TV shows, right? Which, oh, this is a comedy. This is a family comedy is the way it's advertised. Oh, great. I'll watch that. That seems like a good idea. Something harmless to watch. Something good. But then they throw this word in. They throw that word in. They start talking about this subject or that subject or things that are going on that are not so family friendly, right? And so often we can... When they're in that subtle form, we say, oh, well, we can just kind of ignore that or we'll just kind of overlook that and think that it won't affect us, right? But over time, it does. So we have to be so very careful. I thought about also uh, Genesis 19 is we have the account there of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. And you recall the situation there where these two cities had just become so excessively wicked that you couldn't even find ten righteous people there. Remember, Abraham had tried to reason with God, to bargain with God. Well, maybe if we could find this many there, would you not destroy the cities? Because he's worried about his nephew and his nephew's family who dwelled there at the time, Lot. 
And so he works God all the way down to 10, you remember. But there weren't even 10. And before the cities are actually destroyed, these two angels go into the city to warn Lot and his family so that they can be delivered from the destruction that is to come. And while they're there, it talks about how the men of the city came in to try and know these visitors. And the suggestion there is that this was sexual immorality running rampant, as was uh, one of their primary problems there in these two cities. And so, verse 11 is interesting to me because it talks about how these angels struck the men, it says there, who were at the doorway of the house, struck them with blindness because they were trying to break the door down and get in. But it says there at the end of the verse that they became weary trying to find the door. Now you picture that. Here you've got these individuals that are so set on doing these sinful things that even once they're struck with blindness and they can't see anymore, yet they're still trying to find the door, still trying to break it down so that they can accomplish their selfish lusts. And I just, in thinking about that, couldn't help but think how accurate that is when it comes to Satan. You know, we can strike uh, Satan with blindness in a sense. You think about, well, I'm tempted to do this. Well, I'm going to open up my Bible and read. Or I'm going to say a prayer. Or I'm going to call my brother and say, hey, brother, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with this thing right now. Would you just pray for me or talk to me, kind of, you know, help me get my head on straight here? We do things like that to, to guard against the temptations that come our way, as we should. But that doesn't mean he's going to stop. No, he, he's still going to, to try and get in. You remember when Jesus was tempted there in the wilderness in Luke's account, it talks about how when he had finished every temptation, he left him for a while, for a time. It wasn't that Satan was done with Jesus, done tempting him. It was just, okay, well, I'll leave you alone for, for a minute, and I'll be back. He always comes back. He always keeps trying. Now, again, it's, it's our decision, ultimately. Uh, Satan can't just force himself in and just take us over against our will. Uh, just as we have a decision to open the door for Jesus, we have the same ability to choose to open the door for our adversary as well. And James makes this plain here in James chapter 1, verse 12, there beginning. It says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved... He will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say, when well, he's tempted, I'm tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he, does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires, and such enticed. And when that desire has conceived, it says it gives birth to sin, and sin that is fully grown brings forth death. So do not be deceived, he says, my beloved brethren. So, sin is something we choose. We leave the back door unlocked. We leave that window cracked. And over time, when we give in to these temptations that we have to do things we ought not, that's what leads to us transgressing the law of God. Sin is a transgression of the law, 1 John 3 and 4. And we have to remember that as cunning as the adversary is, like we said, there's no way that he can force us to do what is wrong. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13 bears this out for us. It says, No temptation has overtaken you uh, except such as is common to man. In other words, we all face the same kind of temptations. Now, sometimes we have certain weaknesses uh, individually that another might not have. I'm more susceptible to this thing than you would be. But nonetheless, we all face the same kinds of temptations. It's, it's all common to man. But notice he says, God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. There's never going to be a situation that arises where you just have to open the door for, for Satan. No. 
With the temptation, he will always make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. No matter how powerful the temptation seems, and sometimes it does seem like you just feel like every fiber of your being wants to do this thing that you know you shouldn't do. How can I not? Well, you can not. <laughs> you can control it. And it all stems from what do you want the most? Who do you love the most? Really is what it boils down to. The way of escape is, is really knowing the will of God and being willing to choose that over whatever it is that you're facing. Whatever else, whatever desire is, is warring against that. What you know to be right. But let us never think that we are powerless. Uh, you have all the control. You really do. And God is willing to give you all the tools you need to always open the door for the right person. Which lion are you feeding? We talk about how Satan is likened to that roaring lion. It's interesting to note that Jesus is also referred to as a lion. In Revelation 5 and verse 5, it says, One of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. One of the many descriptions we have of Jesus, one of the ways that he's described is this lion of the tribe of Judah. I came across this little short story, and I think it's so powerful. It's just a paragraph long, but it talks about this old tribal leader who spoke with his grandson. He said, My son, there are two lions inside all of us. One is evil. It is anger, jealousy, greed, resentment, arrogance, Lies. The other is good. It is joy, peace, love, hope, humility, forgiveness, and truth. The grandson thought about it for a minute, and he asked his grandfather, Which lion wins? And the old man simply replied, The one you feed. How true that is. Every day we're faced with decisions. We've got these, almost like the old cartoons, right? Where you've got the little angel over here and the little devil over here. You do what's right. You do what's right. Do what you want to do. Right? And they're over here talking in one ear or the other. And the guy's trying to figure out which one am I going to listen to. I always thought that was funny in, in those cartoons. It seems like at the end of the cartoon... You know, originally he's kind of brushing the angel away. Well, I'm going to do what I want to do, right? But then by the end, he's, he's flicking the little devil off of his shoulder. And he goes and does what's right. And as childish as we might view that, it, it's, it's so very true. We have every day decisions we have to make. Who are we going to let in the door? Who's going to dwell with me? Who's going to define my life and uh, my eternity? Which lion am I going to feed? You have your Bibles handy there. Let's, let's open up and read in a couple of places here. Let's go to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. And let's read there beginning in uh, verse 16. We'll read down to the end of the chapter. So Galatians 5, verse 16. It says, I say then... Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. The works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, Sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions and heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, 
revelries and the like. I like how he does that, you know, because it's... Well, Paul didn't say this specific thing that I want to do is sin. Okay, was it like some of these other things he listed? Well, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, it's bad then, right? We know what's wrong, don't we? It's very, very easy to figure that out. But notice he says, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I've told you in times past, that those who practice those kinds of things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But, in contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness and goodness and faithfulness, it is gentleness and self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit, not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. So there's two pathways. We have to choose which one we're going to pursue. He talks about those, those that are Christ's there uh, at the end of what we just read. You go back just a page or so in your Bible there to chapter 3, and we can identify who he's talking about there. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26, you're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus, as many of you as were baptized into Christ, you put on Christ. And there's neither Jew or Greek or slave or free, there's male or fe uh, neither male or female, but you're all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, See, the same language is employed here. So it's those that have obeyed the gospel, that have put him on in baptism, put the old man to death. Uh, if you are Christ, he says, you're Abraham's seed, you are heirs according to the promise. The promise of eternal life. John chapter 14, verse 23 Jesus there answering his disciples, he said, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him. And we will come to him. Notice we will make our home with him. So he who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. What a, a humbling and beautiful thought that... Jesus wants to dwell with you, wants to make his home with you. We who have sinned, who have broken the laws of God, who are not worthy of any good thing from God's hand, but yet he's loved us so much. And if we're willing to keep his words, to follow his instructions, he says, not only me, but my father also will come and, and abide with him. James chapter 4, verse 7 says, Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. So the reality is, like we've said, who at my door is standing? Well, there's two people at your door. We know who's at the front door. There's somebody back there, too, at the back door. Who are you going to let in today? Who are you going to let in tomorrow? Who's going to dwell with you in your life? The choice is really yours to make. Now, I thought it would be fitting, since we borrowed the title of our lesson from, like we said, that hymn that we sometimes sing, to actually look at the words of that as we close. Who at my door is standing, patiently drawing near, entrance within demanding? Whose is the voice I hear? Lonely without he's staying, lonely within am I. While I am still delaying, I am condemned to die. Sweetly the tones are falling, Open the door for me. If thou will keep my calling, I will abide with thee.
door of my heart I hasten. Thee will I open wide. Though he rebuke and chasten, he shall with me abide. Of course, it's our desire that everybody here today will make this decision to let the right party into your life, to open the door of your heart to the right individual, the one that seeks your ultimate well-being, who died for you on a cross on Calvary. But you have to make that decision. That is our lesson today. We're going to sing our song of invitation, which speaks to the fact that there is a great day coming. There is going to be a final day, a day in which judgment will be enacted by, by God Almighty. We will have to give an account as to who we've been dwelling with, who we've been entertaining every evening for dinner, as it were. Who have we let in? Well, if you've been letting in the wrong party, there's no better time to kick him to the curb and to invite in the one that you should be dwelling with, that wants to abide with you and bless your life and give you eternal life. So we stand ready to assist you this morning if you need to come forward and uh, share the desire to make yourself right with God in whatever way that looks like. We, we hope that you'll do that now while we stand together and sing this song.